La Basilica is situated on a hill in the north of Quito, the Divine City, and is one of the city's most monumental buildings. It is the architectural symbol of an autocratic Catholic Church that dominated the country's faithful until the Liberal Revolution. The capital of Ecuador, this Baroque colonial city high up in the South American Andes is where our journey begins on what is known as the rail bus, but more of this later. On the 6th of December 1536, Quito was newly founded and built on the ruins of an Inca town. So originated the Plaza Grande, the square in which many of the country's historic events have taken place. From the country's foundation until its independence, it's a truly Baroque gem of a Spanish colonial city. The Catedral Metropolitana is located on one side of the square. The entire complex is a combination of various building epochs. After each earthquake, the church was rebuilt and substantially enlarged. Today, the city has a new attraction. El Teleférico, the highest cable car in South America. The spectacular views are quite overwhelming. When the Spanish conquered the Inca realm, various Catholic orders followed. The Jesuit order built the Baroque Church of La Campania de Jesus that is known as the most remarkable religious building in the whole of South America. San Francisco Square in front of the monastery has, since the arrival of the Spanish, been one of the city's three central meeting places and is situated above the Plaza Grande. The monks of the Franciscan order settled here. Around 20 kilometers north of Quito is the Mitad del Mundo, the middle of the world. In 1736, during a topographical survey, the equator was located here and the circumference of the earth calculated. Next to it, an open-air museum was built, a replica of an ancient Indian village. The old town of Quito with all its alleys, buildings, courtyards and many churches is truly unique. The Cala de la Ronda is the city's oldest alley, beautiful old buildings packed close together with balconies and romantic patios. During a performance of the Bale Indio Humanizate, the spirit of the country's original inhabitants springs to life including the diversity of its regions, united by the Andes. Dance, music and clothing indicate strong Peruvian influence. Peru was once the center of the Inca realm. The huge iron figure of the winged virgin of Quito, the city's symbol, is located on the volcanic cone of El Parichilo that towers protectively above the old town. A large statue dedicated to General Sucre plus a stone cross as situated in front of the main entrance to the impressive monastery complex of the Dominican Order of Santo Domingo. The splendidly furnished Capilla Virgen del Rosario is famous and was donated by Emperor Carl V. The former capital of the northern Inca realm became the most Spanish city of the New World and churches, monasteries and squares continue to shine out in all of their colonial splendor. On the outskirts of Quito is the city's station, once an important meeting place, but today a sleepy reminder of bygone times. This is the Shiva Express, a colorful bus on rails. A final word with the conductor and passengers wave farewell. The journey begins. We travel through the outskirts of the city, an adventurous journey on the Alto Ferro de las Volcanas, 
along the road of volcanoes. This extravagant vehicle on rails rushes past walls and buildings that gradually become less frequent. Then the first green agricultural areas appear. Shiva is the name of the typical old-fashioned buses of Latin America. People simply jump on and off the moving buses. One of the road buses has been converted to rail. We pass through several small villages, but soon only nature accompanies our journey. The fertile highlands of the Andes, between snow-covered volcanoes. A real adventure. Close to Machachi, the first section of the railway line comes to an end. We stop in the middle of nowhere and disembark the train. And are greeted by a man on horseback. He's the owner of the Hacienda Alegria. For four generations, it's been a colonial estate and has been open to tourists for several years. In addition to horses, cows are bred for milk and meat production, and llamas provide wool, as well as being a means of transport. There's a small group of llamas, plus an informative talk. As early as 2500 BC, the llama was domesticated in Peru, and it's lived in the Andes highlands ever since. The single-story main building of the hacienda is colored bright yellow, and it has a porch and small fountain. Nothing indicates that it lies at such a high altitude. With much sweat, labor, and perseverance, generations of immigrants have established estates such as this within the remote landscape, and have provided employment to the indigenous people. Further south, we travel on the Panamericana Sur, and more volcanoes appear along our route, Cotopaxi and Ilenisa Sur. The high altitude of the valleys makes it easy to forget that the volcanoes are 5,000 meters above sea level. Next, we take a short break. As throughout Latin America, huge Spanish estates originated on Indian land in the high valleys of the Sierra. Here, roses are cultivated. In huge hall-like tents grow the queen of flowers. Lines and lines of rose bushes, well nourished with both water and fertilizer. The stalks of the fresh blossoms are each cut to the same length and then carefully wrapped in large, moist mats. Ecuador produces 109 million kilos of roses and is one of the largest rose-producing countries in the world. Long-stemmed, high-quality products from the Andes highlands. The climate of this region is ideal for roses, and over the course of time, the logistics of worldwide distribution have been perfected to a fine art. The colorful bags of flowers are placed on a special holding device that's fixed to ropes that lead through the large tents. A perfect system. Next, the hangers are pulled into a central hall. Workers clean the roses and check the quality of the blossoms. Then they're separated according to color, type and length of stalk and transported to the nearby airport. We continue on the Panamericana Sur road that travels from Alaska in the north of America right across the continent to as far as the coast of Tierra del Fuego. A road that is at times narrow and then wide. 
The green and fertile pastures in the shadow of the Carihuayazo volcanoes look like those in the Alps. Well-fed cows chew their cud and are milked in the meadow. There are rails too, although they're no longer in use, and the small Urbina station has also survived. Located at the foot of the volcano, it's a scene of lonely isolation. It's amazing to think that a small steam engine once called at this old and abandoned train station high up in the mountains. Now the Panamericana Sur heads downhill. This section is again quite narrow. Next, buildings appear in the suburbs of the capital of the province of Chimborazo. Rio Bamba, a city that following liberation by the Spanish was for three years the capital of Ecuador. This is the exact center of Ecuador. That explains the existence of the monument of geographer Pedro Maldonado in the square in front of the cathedral. The facades of the 19th century buildings plus a well-ordered street network make this colonial city a fine example of urban planning. The original Rio Bamba was situated 20 kilometers from here and was founded in 1534 above a destroyed Inca settlement. However, in 1797, a devastating earthquake destroyed everything and two years later, a new city was built here. Squares and parks were created, places of welcome relaxation. Huge mosaics feature both the country's and the city's past, a moving and dramatic history. From the Spanish conquest, then the colonial period, until independence. The artificial hill next to the Franciscan San Antonio Church provides a wonderful view across both church domes and roofs. The city is surrounded by several snow-covered volcanic mountains. Occasionally, early in the morning, when the city is still asleep, the small station opens briefly. Then the rail bus appears out of the darkness. A second twin train, because the railway line is only accessible in certain sections. Passengers embark and the train leaves the station. The Shiva Express leaves the city whose roads are still empty. And soon the morning sun submerges the otherwise dreary suburb beneath a friendly sky. From Riobamba, we continue in a southerly direction through the province of Chimborazo. Through narrow canyons and along steep slopes, the train struggles from one high valley to the next. Passengers become accustomed to its constant shaking and rumbling and enjoy the ever-changing landscape. In one section, the rails travel through a small settlement, then uphill and downhill, but constantly towards our final destination. The bus on rails seems to be in a hurry. Frequently, we cross the Panamericana that looks like a small country road. Road traffic must stop as our fast bus has the right of way. About 40 kilometers south of Rio Bamba, we reach Guamote. The rail bus stops in the center of the village. 
It doesn't disturb the traffic simply because there isn't any. Here the streets are of mud, cobblestone and colourful buildings. We see the Indias in their colourful attire. And rural Andean scenery. The people here speak Quechua and like to pose for visitors. Here it seems as though time has stood still. When the Chiva Express and other buses stop here, passengers are given the opportunity to enjoy a meal in the village's open-air kitchens. The Indio women gather here to eat and to exchange local gossip. Most pig makes for a tasty treat, an idyll amidst the Andean highlands. When the rail bus arrives at its weekly destination, it has to struggle with a great deal of hustle and bustle. Because this is market day. Mountain farmers in ponchos and felt headwear arrive from the surrounding villages in small lorries and by foot with their animals. They sell the vegetables and fruit that they have cultivated. For the women with their colorful ponchos, the market day means much shopping and chatting. An authentic market, meat is sold, both raw and roasted, next to market stalls that sell underwear and hygiene products. The animal market takes place in a meadow. Here farmers both buy and sell. There is a constant coming and going. They also sell from their lorries. Modern times have arrived here too. At the end of the market day, everyone returns to their village. The journey on the rail bus continues. Passengers embark and slowly, the Chiva Express crosses the village's main street and departs. The adventure goes on. A remarkable journey on the road of volcanoes. Our route passes through the half-desert of Teocayas and through the Rio Pomachachi Canyon, in which, during the rainy season, plunging water often damages the rails. But today, everything is peaceful. We reach the end of the second rail section, Palmira Station. The rails are arranged in such a way that the train is able to turn around and enter the station back to front. Here, we leave the rail bus. It's impossible to continue by rail. The second rail bus is now cleaned and duly examined as any serious technical hitch during the journey would be a major problem. The Shiva Express returns and we continue on the Panamericana further south through high valleys and pastures and over mountain passes both uphill and downhill. Here this dream road becomes a single lane and certainly not a highway. There's little traffic here. After an hour, we reach Alausi, deep down in a valley, but at an altitude of 2,356 meters above sea level. A small town of the Sierras that during its high season was a holiday resort for the rich of Guayaquil. The highland climate fascinated the people of the Pacific coastal region. During the rule of President Eloy Alfaro, the railway line from Guayaquil to Quito was built. He 
established compulsory education and ordered the construction of kindergartens, schools and universities. Despite the subsequent decline in power of the Catholic Church, saints such as St. Pedro continued to be worshipped. Today the street in front of the small station is deserted. But at the beginning of the 20th century, Alasi enjoyed some economic success. Alasi was an important rail junction between the highlands and the harbour town on the Pacific Ocean. Suddenly it appears, the third version of the Shiva Express. Again, it is similar to the other two and is ready for the third and most spectacular section of the journey. Through a narrow canyon around 700 meters into the depths. A special maneuver is necessary. Then the rail bus stops. Passengers get on board and the last part of the adventure is about to begin. In this carriage, passengers have left various messages on the walls out of both joy and fear. Slowly, the rail bus departs from the small village of Alausi. Another maneuver on the single track line and we're ready to travel. Down into the canyon below. We pass numerous buildings situated on steep slopes. The railway line was blasted into the rock face, an architectural masterpiece accomplished by thousands of Jamaican labourers in just one year. There are several bends, and larger ones lead into the actual canyon. Suddenly and unexpectedly we stop. A recent storm has caused a landslide. The line is blocked. Because this happens frequently, there are special workers on the train who remove the piles of rubble. Soon we're able to continue our journey. From here, we can take a look into the depths below and to our destination. Narith del Diabolo, the Devil's Nose. Here begins the most difficult and dangerous part of our journey, across a steep slope 500 meters down. Here the rails zigzag. We move slowly forwards and then backwards. So the train is able to gradually overcome the difference in altitude. When we arrive at the bottom of the canyon, everyone is relieved. The small and neat Sibambe station is closed. It's necessary for the train to turn round here because the line that travels to the harbour city of Guayaquil on the Pacific Ocean is no longer in use. The Chiva Express stops and passengers disembark and enter the bottom of the valley. The view from the Devil's Nose is most impressive. When the bus on rails begins its return journey, everyone becomes a little nervous. Are we really going to travel up there? Slowly and cautiously, the train again zigzags backwards and forwards. This time uphill, not downhill. After all the excitement, the final section into the upper section of the canyon is far less worrying. Alasi appears. Here, the world's last great adventure on rails comes to an end. A challenging yet marvelous experience, thanks to the amazing Autoferro de los Volcanes.